I'll wait until everyone is, uh, is in. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on which side of the world you're in. And um, welcome to the, the first panel as part of the Digital Art Month initiative that the CADAF team has launched for October 2020 in New York. We are very excited about the initiative, but also to um, kick off the, the panel with today's topic, which is around the importance of public art, um, both physical public art, and of course, we'll discuss digital public art. I, before we start and I introduce the, our guest for today, I just want to say that um, these panels are recorded. So if you don't want to show up in video, you can turn your, your video off. And also you are automatically muted, but we um, would like you to participate with comments and questions. Myself and my colleague Elizabeth will monitor the questions for our guests. Uh, and you can do that in the chat. So without uh, further ado, I would like to welcome and thank our guest today, Savona Bailey McLean, who is Executive Director and Chief Curator of the West Harlem Art Fund, Jess Conister, the founder of Studio As We Are, um, which is also present in our Digital Art Month with several artists, Kendall Henry, who is the director of the program called Percent for Art in New York City, and Jeffrey LeFrançois, who is executive director of the Meatpacking District Management Association. I am Julia Archetti, part of the CADAF team. And um, I'll just like to kick off with a statement for our um, guests today. It's a statement that I wrote. So it's my own quote, and it's about public art. So public art in communities can contribute to a community's identity, foster community pride, and enhance the quality of life for its residents and visitors. Now, this is an open question. So I don't know who would like to uh, you know, take it um, first, who would like to answer first, but what do you think about this statement? Is it true? or not? Is it a, does it make it too simple in terms of public art? You're obviously here today as a sort of promoters and a facilitator of the arts. Um, and Jeffrey, you, on top of that, you're also uh, responsible for the development and welfare of the meatpacking district. So I'd like to ask you, what do you think about this statement? Is that true that public art can really help foster a community's identity and the quality of life of its residents and visitors. Absolutely, in short. And first of all, thank you for having this panel and uh, thrilled to be on it um, with everybody here today. And as a neighborhood playing host um, to this Digital Art uh, Month campaign, which is fantastic. And I think that <clears throat> It goes to show in the value of public art, the spectrum um, that it can reach um, of people, what we're learning living through a pandemic and how art is informed around that, how we can still make art accessible. Um, the best thing about public art is that it is accessible to the public. Um, you know, whether it's digital art in this case um, or a, a sculpture in the middle of a plaza or a park, um, you're, you, you, you should not be prevented from ex experiencing it, visualizing it, being a part of it. And as somebody who oversees you know, a neighborhood and is responsible for cleanliness and programming and marketing and all that kind of stuff, economic development is a big part of what I do. And I can't imagine art not being a fundamental part of how we think about economic development as a neighborhood in New York City. I'm gonna, you know, add on to what Jeffrey just said. Um, so looking, that, that's a very interesting question because that's a question a lot of municipalities, a lot of organizations ask because there's always funding attached to it to make these things be realized. And uh, just looking at my own program, um, my program started, the Percent Fraud program out of the culture, Department of Cultural Affairs started in 1982. 
And if anybody remembers what New York City was like in 1982, um, it was, you know, graffiti ridden. It was, it felt dangerous. It, you know, just, if you don't know, look at some movies that was made in, in, in New York City back then. And the idea to create a program like that, which basically says that whatever the city's building, 1% of that construction cost must go to the commissioning of work of art when the city was basically almost bankrupt. That shows the level of importance that art could play in, in, in the rebuilding, if you will, of a city. It's not just, and that's, that's the same for the, the subway system, that's the same for the city at large, and that's the same for many different organizations that, that have these types of programs within their, within their cities, and there's about 500 of them plus. So to answer your question in a long, drawn-out way, yes, and it's been proven over and over and over and over again that, you know, public art, and partic particularly, is very important to the, you know, the revitalization, to the, the economic um, development to the civic pride of, of communities. And that's why we keep doing it. And that's why everybody is in, interested in it. And that's why it's still happening uh, through hard times and through prosperous times. And, you know, and I'll end with saying, just look what happened um, when George Floyd was murdered. Look what happened with the economic, you know, turned down. You know, artists are just going out there and, and being supported and sort of speaking their minds about this, this time with art all over the place. So there you go. That's my quick answer to, to that question. Um, jumping in, yes, um, yeah, if, really when you look at public art historically in the United States, uh, it goes back, you know, to the early 19th century and uh, with mostly statues. And that's why statues are becoming Coming such a controversy right now, Confederate statues. But then it shifted in the 1930s. And when it shifted, it was because of Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. So you had the Federal Art Project, and then you had the Farm Project, which dealt with photographs. And then you have art and architecture, which led to percent for art. So we've always had public art in the United States has just gone through many variations. And it really shifted again in the 1970s, you know, speaking to what Kendall is talking about, where it went from being this national type of program where it was propaganda to show how the government was caring about the people to more local art. So now we have more art that's localized and communities can engage and also have a say in what the art is going to be in their community. It's more site specific. And that has been the continuation of public art in the United States. Now we're looking at ways to make it more accessible because when you look at communities of color, they have less public art than in more wealthier established neighborhoods. And now we're trying to figure out how to make that balance. And I think digital art, Digital Art Month, is trying to help bridge those divides so that there could be more accessibility of public art. That's my, my two cents. Yes, and I think you've, um you've all uh, kind of said a few things that I would like to then continue the conversation on. Um, so, but I'm gonna start, uh, so I wanna start with you and with what you, you said now in terms of the public art, so the, in the US that existed um, since sort of the beginning of the 19th century, which is true. Obviously, um, in general, public art existed, I'm thinking also in Italy, back in the Renaissance, for example, it was extremely important um, as a, perhaps um, a uh, confirmation of wealth of certain family, patronage, et cetera. So the evolution of public art throughout the years um, has become in, um, incredibly sort of interesting and sort of different throughout the centuries. But what are the challenges, you know, especially from your point of view, you have been involved in various projects also of public art. What are today um, the bureaucratic hurdles, for example, in order to, and it, it's probably it ties into your idea of also of access. It's not just getting people to public art, but how do we get more access from a point of view of processes and bureaucratic um, 
in some stages to build more public art. And now I'm talking about obviously physical public art, installations, sculptures, and then we can also uh, delve deeper into digital art, for example, and what could be um, the positive of bringing in more digital art. But now I wanted to, yes, I wanted to ask you more, a little bit about the challenges and how maybe we can overcome those challenges in your point of view. Well, cost is the, the biggest challenge. I think everybody would um, agree to that. You know, the cost of public art dealing with infrastructure where you wish to place um, the art and then getting community buy-in. Those are some of the main issues in presenting art. And, uh, and then you have government agencies like Percent for Art and other types of um, entities like in New York, DCAS. Um, you have other um, uh, school construction authority that get percentages of um, funds for building a structure and then they include public art. But when you're talking about temporary public art, it's very expensive and you have to deal with a lot of hurdles, insurance, installation, deinstallation, um, community boards, you know, the politics of that so that you can just get to the point of presenting uh, a public art, which has a variety of, um, of styles. It could be installation, it could be a mural, it could be a sculpture, freestanding work. So those are some of the, the hurdles that we go through. To make it more accessible, that's difficult. It's also about perceptions too. How do you get sponsors? How do you get people to financially support you? And you have people that wanna get the most bang for the buck. And sometimes that's not in poorer neighborhoods or communities of color. How do you raise the funds, get the support to present those arts? I think digital art might help. And I've done some digital installations where that helped to um, deal with costs, making things more cost effective, cost efficient, last a lot longer. So it's all of those challenges together. And I'm sure um, Jessica can speak to it, Kendall can speak to it, and then Jeff as a sort of presenter in the meatpacking district of some of the digital works you're showing this month. Uh, yeah, um, I think with Digital Art Month, thank you for um, having me guys, uh, good to be here. Uh, it's been a really kind of exciting moment for all of us because like you said, it's. Uh, allows for us to create a very accessible kind of experience uh, across New York City um, because of uh, social media platforms that everybody has access to. And, and what we wanted to do here is work with artists from around the world who are already creating uh, augmented reality sculptures or face mask effects and put them in new environments so people could get out of the house in a safe way and and go to their favorite neighborhoods but experience it in a new way and also uh, digital art is experiential in nature which is an exciting i think aspect for this like public art display because uh, for example you know you have some of these augmented reality pieces that are like orbs and they move and you can kind of interact with them and even though it's not there you can capture this unique experience with the city being the backdrop and really kind of create a better you know commute for yourself or if you're going there to see it because you know you're you're huge into augmented reality and digital in the digital art scene that's awesome too it gets you out of your house instead of just projecting it into your home, you can go and, and experience it. And again, one of your favorite neighborhoods. And I think that um, art should cost money. Uh, artists uh, are creating something, there's value in that. Um, you know, that Savannah mentioned like the WPA, Works Progress Administration and government funding art, it's critical. It was critical to the identity of the United States, you know, uh, World War II, post-World War II, New York City's funding of the arts is integral to the city's identity, whether it's as the city as a whole or each neighborhood. Um, it's really, it's unfortunate that 
to produce public art, it costs so much money because it's a barrier. But at the same time, I struggle with this because we also want artists to see the value in their work. Um, you know, it, it, it means something to be a creator um, and to be an artist and, and you should be um, compensated for that. So it's really, it's a difficult um, sort of world to operate in because it's a public benefit. Uh, the list is long, I think, when it comes to benefits of art. And at the end of the day, it's determining um, the value of supporting that. And I think New York City, our arts budget is, our arts budget is huge. Um, when you compare us to other cities in the, in the country on scale and then internationally, we spend a tremendous amount of money on our cultural organizations. And for good reason. Um, it's not all public, but a lot of it is. Um, and so I, I think that that it's tricky, but it's really important to recognize that art has value and artists need to be valued in the form of pay. Um, so it's, it's important to recognize that. Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey, can I ask you, I mean, from your point of view, obviously, um, yes, and also here we're talking about New York City, which is one of the cities in the world that has most art that is definitely a, one of the, as a city, biggest supporter of the arts. But um, I agree with you, we should really now be able to try and develop the presence of arts in smaller communities as well. That should be the aim, but especially the, the meatpacking. I think in the, in the last few years has really seen a, an evolution where there's more and more art within the, the district. So from your point of view, and also when you have um, sort of open calls or when you do sort of commission, is that the district that supports that from a point of view of an artist, uh, artwork, and all of the cost for an installation? Sure, it would be a combination of, it could be money from our you know, existing budget, or we would seek sponsors to bring um, you know, public art to our plazas. We were under construction for five years, and now we have amazing, um, massive plazas that we want to develop a public art program as a part of. We're hoping yeah. to kick that off. Um, we have digital art going on right now, which is really fantastic. And it's, I love walking out and seeing people doing it. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of another form of art. You get to watch somebody interact um, with this as they interact on their own. Um, and then no, as, as a part of what we would do for the, for the neighborhood would be to spend money on public art and figuring out how to do that and I mean, it, it's the reality that you want to get bang for your buck. That's important. Um, and from an economic development lens, that means foot traffic. That means press. Um, you know, that means attention. And so how we get there um, is based on sort of what our goals are at the end. Yes. Uh, Kendall, can I, can I ask you a bit more about the, the percent for our program? And how do you work together with the districts and, and with the city? In tr when, when you have to develop a sort of a public art project mm -hmm. and how do you sort of choose the artist and what the process is and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about one of the of, uh, one of your I'm sure many favorite projects that you worked on. Well I'm not talking about a favorite one there's some artists that's going to be out and <laughs> but the one that um, you would like to share with us. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about that one for a minute. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so the way my program works is that um, when a, um, a facility is being built, I take 1% and I do the 1% in quotes because it's not actually 1%, it's a percentage of a number and it's very complicated math. But I take a, some of that money and I um, commission a, an artist. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, and so the thing is we, we don't, I don't determine where the project happens, right? So that the city determines where construction determines where that project happens. Luckily, you know, schools are being built all over the city within all kinds of neighborhoods. So, you know, we, we when we commission a work, we really take that into account, knowing that this may be the only artwork people in that community might see because, you know, it's, they don't go to the museums, they don't go to galleries for cost purposes, for intimidation purposes. And, you know, people just don't think that galleries and museums are for them, so they don't go, and, and for many different reasons. So, so that's good in that, you know, we do projects in schools, we do projects in anything, in streetscapes, whatever it is. And so 
we jump, we, keep, we can't do all of them, but we jump at the opportunities when they're in underserved communities um, and really make a, a concerted effort to look for artists in those communities um, to be part of that process, to be commissioned as part of that process. And I think one misconception that artists have is that they would have to have a lot of public art experience to do one of our projects. That is not the case. Mm -hmm. I would say about 85, 90% of our artists have never done public art before. And we mm -hmm. like it that way because we get to, you know, nurture um, a young artist into, you know, realizing the opportunities that they have for doing public art outside of, of their studio work. And so um, within our process, we have a, what we call a panel process where we have usually two meetings. The first meeting is we're looking at, a, we invite people to, to come. And again, different types of people come depending on what the project is. If it's a community that's really involved with their community, it, there's a lot of people that show up. If it's a, a, a place where it is not a really set community, then it's sort of, it's a, it's a more like, you know, um, technical kind of group of people making a decision. But, but we make a concerted effort to really tap into local community, local culture as much as possible and have that reflect in, in the artwork. And we don't determine what the themes are, but we, that comes from the artist and it just be, we just it, it require that it be site specific. We don't even define that. Um, mm -hmm. So the process is quite open and I sort of always use these opportunities to talk, to let people know that this exists, that this happens and please you know, look into being part of our, our process. Aside from that, we also work with, um, you know, um, local, there are many different small arts organizations that commission artwork and Savannah being one of them. Um, and, you know, you have the bids have their own art programs, you know, like Madison Square um, Conservancy has their art program within the park. The High Line, you know, has their art program. So there's a lot of these different ones. And so if it's in a on city property, chances are I'm the advisory panel for that as well. So I look to make sure that, you know, that they're looking at a lot of these artists who may not have an opportunity otherwise. A lot of times people say, well, I want an artist from my community. That's great. And we always, always support that. But we also want to take artists from the Brownsville community and put them in a project in the meatpacking district. You know, why not? We also want to take artists from Harlem and put them into like, you know, bed -Stuy because you know, New York City is one, is one, one community, though it's made out of all these little communities. That's always been an issue with, with me. It's just sort of like spread the wealth and, and just not, and, and sorry to use this word, get a wise artist within their community only. And so that's very, very important. Um, and I'm going on a ramble here. I don't know if I answered your question, but, but yeah, so, so this is, and our, pro, you know, and, and going back to something what uh, Savannah said about uh, when you asked a question about difficulties or challenges, you know, the cities, the city itself is a bureaucracy. And I'm going to be the first one to admit that. And, um, and so I think we need to make a better concerted effort to reach and support these smaller arts organizations that may not have the funding, uh, may not have the know-how, or may not have the, you know, the, the, the resources of, of people or the resources of funding or the resources of whatever to support them to do that public art in, in their communities. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's, that, that's, that's my ramblings on, and yeah. No, it wasn't, it wasn't a rambling at all. It was very interesting, but it, it really gave us a, a little bit more of understanding of how um, the program works and how the program can work with the various bits um, or the various other programs that are going on sort of in New York City. And I thought that was really important. But in terms of the projects that you worked on, were there any then within, well, with digital arts, for example? Yeah, so, so. Um, you to choose amongst the various projects. Yeah, so, so, I, so I, I work on two types of projects and for, for the purposes of, of this conversation, I'm gonna divide the projects into two categories, permanent and temporary. Uh, for permanent artwork, um, because of the funding, where I get my funding from, my funding is part of an architect uh, of 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 construction. Of this part of the architecture, so it has to be a solid piece of something that lasts at least thirty years. So it's hard to use certain types of materials or certain types of media in that format, and because a big component of that is maintenance, right? And so all of my artwork is being placed in non traditional art spaces. So I'm putting artwork in a police station, I'm putting an artwork in a school, I'm putting an artwork in a courthouse, where these are not art spaces. So these folks are not able, they may be able to change a light bulb, but they're not able to maintain 
a digital artwork, let's say. So it's impossible for me to do that kind of work, um, digital work in that environment. But I do work, um, I'm on the committees of Times Square, of Madison Square Park, of the DOT art, the Department of Transportation Art Program. And so they do a lot of temporary artwork. And, um, and so they, allow, they, they, are, they can do this um, digital work, which is brilliant because you know, the many facets of digital work allows the same thing access. And there's many different ways of defining access, again, because people don't go to museums and galleries, but there's this other component of the interactivity. And, and when one is able to interact with art, like a digital art, like you described the, the virtual reality thing there, they now open themselves to knowing that they, they can access art, other forms of artwork. And so that's such a valuable kind of commodity to be able to do that. And with, with temporary art, um, there's this, this very contemporary issues that could, that could be addressed. What's happening right now uh, that a permanent work would, would not be able to address. So, so all these things are very, very important. That's why it's very necessary. That's why we need to support temporary art. That's why we need to support digital art. That's why we need to support the art in the communities that may last for a few minutes or a few days and not just the permanent, permanent stuff. But there's a lot of support and there's a lot of infrastructure for, for, for permanent stuff. But you know, it, it, I think we need a better balance. And I, I you know, notice I, I did not mention any of my favorite projects because I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you know, you know I, I, have, I have like too many, um, and I don't, I don't want to like sort of like I like this one, and then you know that's all. I'm just being very okay, political is here. There, um, is there a way that people could uh, find out more about the projects that were born out of Percent for Art? That perhaps, if uh, the audience is interested in finding out more. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you just Google uh, um, NYC percent for R, Department of Cultural Affairs, you know, we have, um, uh, it's not the best website, we'll tell you that now, but, but that's, that's the first place to take a look. Um, that's okay. we'll, but we'll there's also- in the chat, so. Yeah, but, but we are just one of many arts organizations that do public art, and I, I like to always give a shout out for all the organizations that want to tread into the public arts um, realm in, within New York City because you know we support all each other and it's we all we have the same goal pretty much. Yes, of course, um, it's a community. Um, I'm gonna uh, do another sort of open question. Um, perhaps Jess, I'll, you might want to take it first. Uh, I think we've uh, touched upon the um, advantages of digital art potentially versus physical public art. Uh, flexibility that you know for augmented reality it could be placed sort of anywhere um, it's interactive so people can perhaps interact with it more and feel more part of the artwork um, may cost less it doesn't need all the infrastructure around it um, but what about a generational limit to it is there a generational limit to digital art i.e. does digital art speak more to us as millennials, for example, or Gen Z, but it doesn't quite cross over a certain age? Do you think that then we're missing out, you know, a, a large part of the audience with digital art? And of course, it's, um, it's meant to be quite a, you know, a tough question, but... I mean, it's a great question. I think you know, uh, obviously millennials and, and Gen Zs are there. We know about this. We, uh, it's been a part of our life for much longer. It's what we know for the most part, especially Gen Zs. My younger sister only knows how to Snapchat and, and Instagram. That's how they communicate. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, if we're looking for an example, like Digital Art Month, we use QR codes. And I think that when you add something like that, that is now widely accepted as something you scan to uh, use for menus and all these things that you can actually then get an older audience in. And so I think really it's about how you present it, whether or not it becomes accessible for a larger like age group or generation, generational group. So um, for this, I think that uh, yeah, some, some people 
um, are going to have a hard time wrapping their mind around it. I think that some people that I speak to that are older are like, is that actually art? And, you know, okay, that's subjective. We can decide, you know, on, um, from our own individual kind of perspective, whether or not something, uh, you know, is that or, or not. But again, for me, um, it's, just thinking about the con concepts surrounding the presentation and understanding that especially with public art you know you can't control your audience there so what can you do you can try and make it again as accessible as possible and so with new media and digital art specifically i think that yeah there's some best practices that can again make it more accessible so i hope that you know answers your your question somewhat um, Yes, you say that some practices sort of make it uh, more accessible. It, but this is, I asked this question because this is also something that I, you know, I'm interested in and how to make, obviously we're talking about the, um, the realm of public art. So ideally a, a type of art that everyone has access to and understands and can enjoy. Um, and how can we really make it uh, easily understandable and easily accessible to everyone at any sort of age group. Um, for me, this is something that as, as I was thinking about so this, th this panel, that was, um, and you know, I was talking to my mom and I thought, hmm, I wonder if the, the reaction uh, for someone who is, for example, 65, like my mom sort of would be the same. And how could we actually, make sure that they also experience that and they learn how to experience that in a, in, in a more sort of um, fulfilling way. In well, I was going to jump in to say, you know, we're at an age where it's more about storytelling and sharing narratives. And that's one of the things that, um, digital art can help with because it's just a stone throw away from television and film that we deal with. And you can blend different disciplines more so with digital um, music, sound, and blending these different elements together can reach a variety of people if you add good storytelling. And if you want to make it more accessible, one of the things I had proposed years ago was having public art districts. We have historic districts. Why don't we have public art districts to help um, keep costs down, to make art more accessible in these districts so people know that these gathering spaces are available to see things, to interact, to um, you know, critique. Um, so there are a number of ways in which we can blend disciplines together with space, because I believe in public uh, open spaces, so we can share these different stories and narratives, more so now than ever before, talking about family, traditions, uh, backgrounds. So I think if we kind of talk with each other more about infrastructure, and how we can have these different nodes available across the city in different disciplines. And then almost like crowdfunding, you kind of work together to build them up. I think we can make the city even more dynamic. And in spite of what people say that New York is dead, we can show them that it never, never did. Well, well, Not even close. So I laugh at them. <laughs> I think that 100% um, to what everybody has said prior to this on this question and to get technical on it, one of the things that I hope lasts out of this living through this pandemic are QR codes and how comfortable people are getting with them, especially in New York City, in the United States. I know Europe and Asia has, been, has taken to QR codes long before the United States actually has. And this is thrusting us to catch up with the rest of the world for good in this case. And not so just about our menus and cocktails and stuff like that, but art and hopefully books and newspapers and right like just the amount of access it can provide by getting people accustomed to scanning that little code uh, with their phone. Um, again, it's a whole new form of access, um, which is so much what this is about. 
um, I think at the end of the day. And that's really exciting. Um, and we're, we're seeing it happen um, because of this digital art month and we're seeing it sort of, the timing is great, right? Everybody's gotten so used to QR codes in the past four months, five months in, the, in New York City. And now as digital art month has hit public spaces, it, it's second nature to sort of swipe that QR code and just experience it and see what it is. And so hopefully there's a, you know, a snowballing effect that comes from that as well. Yeah, Jeffrey, I like your enthusiasm. So we'll, we'll see for the next Digital Art Month, we will be back. Sounds good. <laughs> we will be in the Mid Park District. Um, I have a question. Uh, maybe Jess, uh, you can uh, take this. I know you're maybe only speaking for, um, for the artists that uh, you're presenting as a studio as we are, but this um, Erin saying, um, what is the average age of uh, sort of the creators of Digital Art Month. So Erin, from, from what I from what I know from the artists selected, it's definitely, uh, um, you know, every age, it's sort of, it's quite wide. It's not a, but Jess can tell us a little bit more about. Uh, yeah, artists totally. that, and I, I think um, this also kind of helps with your question before this, but I have, you know, I'm working with artists who, Gosh, I, I blush when I look at their age because I'm like, you're so young. You know, they were born in like the mid 90s. But then also we have, you know, artists who are in their 50s and 60s that are, are you know, primarily working in the digital art space and making art uh, uh, augmented reality uh, pieces through Spark AR. And, um, and they're just as unique and interesting and you would never even like, uh, uh, blink um, when you hear them speak about the digital art world. It, it seems second nature to them as well. So I don't think really digital art discriminates. Like it's really for anyone and every um, everyone who's who's interested in exploring uh, how to create in the space. And so uh, yeah, um, there's a there's a wide range of, of age groups yes. here. Exactly, and um, I also think that artists uh, evolve. So artists who are um, a little bit older than Gen Z. They might have started with the more traditional uh, uh, media, but then now have sort of evolved into also using um, new media art or um, technology for the art. So it's not necessarily, you know, you have to be young or born in the 90s to include technology in your sort of art production. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm just, um, <laughs> I think um, the age question has created a little bit of uh, comments, which is, which, is, uh, which is great. I, um, so I'm going to read a couple of comments uh, um, to you. One is um, uh, an artist says that um, she or he has been making uh, digital art since the 1990. And um, it's more of a question of the built-in bias towards accepting art that you have to turn on and figure out rather than just looking at something and understanding it. Yes, exactly. Don't, but uh, I agree. And it says most audiences don't like to be told they have to work, especially since most public art viewers are passerby of past seekers. Yes, I agree. But this is also one actually of the positives, I think, of digital art. It engages the audience more, perhaps. Um, totally. Whereas, you know, maybe a sculpture or an installation can attract. Um, uh, more people so uh, especially if it's in a square it can create a little bit of, of a community but it could be a very passive way of looking at something you're just sitting there and you're looking at it whereas with digital art you actually have to engage with it um, and also you become a little bit part of the of the artwork so yes um, I agree but also hopefully it's a, it's a way to engage the audience more um, yeah, I, and I, I think just quickly, like uh, what we did with Digital Art Month is we again worked with artists who are already making these works through Instagram, like Spark AR and Snapchat lenses. So we, you know, realize that a lot of people don't want to have to do extra work. They don't want to download a third-party app and whatnot. So I think like using 
social media tools that most, most all people, not everyone, I know a lot of people want to take a detox from Instagram. Like I totally get that, but most of us are on Instagram. Therefore we were hoping that this would be an easier interaction instead of a, a more challenging interaction, but there are still definitely challenges with getting people to stop and interact in public spaces for sure. But then th that's a trend that I, I, I notice have been, you know, evolving over time is the need for interaction in a public artwork to activate it even more than it's being just a sculpture that you just see. Um, and, and again, people have been using QR codes to sort of do that. And there's a speaking monuments and whatnot. But I think, you know, the trend towards because of the way we do things now, uh, everything um, is this level of interaction you know, people are now looking at that and artists are now looking at that for, for in their creation of artwork as well. So whether it be digital or in some other way of interaction, interaction is a, a very important component of, um, of the experience. You know, the passive sculpture, the passive art is sort of almost going by the dinosaur to some degree. And people are looking for something to happen in the artwork or something to be engaged with or something to, to do. And the best types of artworks and the works that don't depend on that, but when it does have that, that element to it, it, it sort of, it's, it, it grabs the audience a little better, particularly if it's a temporary work. Yes, agreed. Um, just want to mention something about Peter, uh, who says that he's a 65 year old plus uh, uh, attendee here, I guess, and he said, um, um, I just want to say that maybe I have not expressed my, my statement about digital art being less accessible to um, older people and older meaning anyone that is not perhaps a millennial or Gen Z but that was a, a, a completely general comment in the sense that um, it could be true that you know people in in that sort of age category might be less familiar or less used to using technology in their everyday life so Others are, are not uh, completely tech savvy, depending also of the work that they do. Um, so I was just wondering whether actually, um, you know, the, the guest on today's panel perhaps agree with me that we might uh, miss out on a, you know, section of the population that are, those that are less tech savvy. And if there was a way perhaps to actually include those people in and a lot of those, um, less tech savvy um, adults, then once they, they use the QR code um, or they put on the VR goggle, they see how actually easy it is. It's, but the, the barrier to entry, the idea that you have to use technology to engage with an artwork might be for, for some, not for everyone, um, a little bit too much. <laughs> So Peter, uh, I thought that that was a bit too long to answer in the, in the chat. So I thought I, I, I share with sort of with, uh, with everyone in case also my question was uh, not um, sort of clear enough. Um, I mean, well, digital, we have... digital is not just QR codes and it is no, not at all, not at all. Just uh, it could be audio. So dealing with you talking about older generations, um, radio was considered innovative when it first hit the scene in the United States. And people are listening to more podcasts than ever before. And they could tune into what they're interested in. So digital could be sound. It could be, again, stories, or it could be commentary, or it could just be um, different uh, experimental sounds. I think we're limiting ourselves to what the definition of digital is because I think now more than ever people want to hear the sounds of other humans since we've been, you know, in quarantine. So it is upon practitioners and presenters to think of a variety of uses when it comes to digital. So therefore we can embrace everybody. So I don't think there are lost opportunities. I just think we need to sit down and talk about what those opportunities are and that could better help connect and link people together. Yes, agreed. Thank you. I just wanna agree entirely on that, that too much digital is just thought of as one thing, but the spectrum is quite broad. Um, yeah. In terms of the, the biases, I, I think that um, 
art is bias, art can be bias. And um, until there's that, that sort of fear factor, that wall is broken down, um, you're gonna feel like it's not for you. Um, it might not be my first reaction to scan a QR code to experience art. So I kind of need that nudge. What is it that we can do? I see there's a question about marketing and how we can like encourage people to experience it in a way that meets them where they are and helps them bring them into that sphere of experiencing this type of digital art. The same can be said for interpreting an impressionist painting. Not everybody likes impressionist painting. Some people understand why they're painted that way. Likewise with cubism and you know various types of sculpture. So there's always a way that art can be seen as being biased and not for a particular person. Um, and unfortunately that comes from education. I think that, that breaking down those biases and getting folks to, to feel comfortable just approaching it. Um, and public art plays a huge role in doing that. Public art is the first step for a lot of people of, of experiencing art. And so getting behind the walls of a museum or a gallery. I think it's really powerful when I think Kendall, you said how museums and galleries, sometimes people don't feel like they're for them. And in particular, I think we see that in, in, in communities of color, which is terribly unfortunate because that shouldn't be the case. And to have that built-in bias, we need to find more ways to break that down. And public art, I think, can play a, a critical role um, in doing that. Yes, um, I was gonna, I mean, we only have 10 minutes left and this is probably, but um, a bit of a long question. Um, but another thing that I wanted to touch upon was um, public art as a catalyst for social change. I mean, one of the um, the installation that um, I really liked also because in a in one of my jobs I actually had the the chance to install the the cage then in um, in Venice was uh, Ai Weiwei's installation from a few years ago called Good Fences Make Good Neighbors in New York, um, and of course it was about uh, the global refugee crisis and um, it, it was a, a very powerful and it was meant to bring a people to you know think about a very important social issue now this is a for me is, is a very delicate um, topic because should art be also be used as a catalyst for social action or has a completely different purpose to it. For example, bringing sort of community together, um, uh, allow the development of a community through visitors or, you know, by obviously installing an artwork, there's a lot of work spread in the community as well. It's always, um, it's always for me a very delicate, and again, I'll, I'll give you um, now the possibility of answering whether art should also take on and sometimes it does it automatically without even because artists like we've seen throughout um sort of the, the black lives matter movement how artists instinctively just were catalysts for social action by expressing their what they were feeling in their emotion of the of the moment um but public art especially permanent public art today, can it help in bringing social change? Should it help? Is that also um, a meaning to public art, in your opinion? Well, I wanted to share the slides I shared with you, Julia. Yes, okay, let's do it. With an artist I like very, very much, uh, Mel Chin, and he did a land art project tied uh, to be bind and he was in California and he helped this community to uh, change land that was um, abandoned or not cared for and to make them into these beautiful sort of gardens and I thought that was f you can see they're beautiful and it was involving community, it was involving those who were interested in helping to change the landscape from uh, barren and uh, 
to temporary to permanent uh, landscape gardens. And I thought that was phenomenal because I love him. He's a great artist, very thoughtful, kind person. And I just thought this was, you know, a wonderful way of changing a community for good. And so sometimes, not always, public art have to, um, you know, deal with politics or the crisis of the moment. But when it does, these are some great examples of what you could do to involve local people, interested people, volunteers to transform a community permanently. So that's my example of what uh, public art can do in the realm of social change. And I'm, I'm gonna add to that too. I, I see um, public art when it relates to social change as, as a universal language. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a language that you know, that is accessible to everyone, that everyone could understand at a certain level. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a tool that's wielded very well by artists who know how to use it. And um, because when we, there's so much going on and there's so much, you know, that, that are being, we're being screamed at, you know, at, at certain things and we don't hear it anymore. And mm -hmm. I think that art is a great way to open up our ears again and open up our eyes to, to things that we see all the time that we don't pay attention to that becomes invisible. Uh, mm -hmm. And art could sort of bring that to life. I mean, there's artists are working in, you know, um, the ideas around, you know, climate ch um, change and the ideas around, uh, 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 about, um, you know, racial injustice. And, and we know these things, but until, but we're, again, the words aren't getting in our, in our ears. And so art is a fantastic way, a good catalyst to say, hey, look at this, look at me. And now that your attention, talk about this. And, and you don't feel intimidated by that kind of conversation because it's, it's something that we could relate to. Um, every culture in every, you know, has, has art, has that, 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 that language. And so to tap into that, I think is a very important tool. Great, thank you. Yes, I agree. I mean, you mentioned a uh, universal language. Um, yes, that I should have uh, mentioned it also in my, um, when I asked the question, but um, yes, and that is uh, the, fundamentally, I think the power of art is to speak across borders um, and to portray a message globally. So thank you. Kendall. Um, I'm going to, oh, we only have uh, five more minutes, so um, I'm going to maybe open up to the audience if, uh, if they have any sort of more questions before we let you go. But thank you for, for participating. This is, uh, this is so important um, to talk about this thing. So, um, Ooh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Brega Campbell? Um, Breha, okay, thank you. Uh, what immediate, um, like the cheese with an A. <laughs> oh, Bria, oh, okay. <laughs> like the cheese, Bri oh, this is a very good way to, <laughs> to say, there you go. Uh, perfect, Bria, that's a great name. Uh, what immediate steps do you think need to be taken by professionals in the art world in order for digital art, crypto art, AR, etc., so new media art, to become accepted by wider audience and popularized in the art world of today? Yeah, I think this is a good, very good question that um, uh, might, might take us quite a long time to answer, but uh, I don't know who wants to who wants to answer first or will contribute to the to answer this question? I mean, I, I will I will put in my two cents. I think uh, with Kadaf and everything that I'm I'm I, I work on through my smaller studio, this is one of our our big things that we're trying to do. And um, I think there's a lot of things that <laughs> that need to be done here. But I think uh, on topic with what we're discussing, 
I'd, I'd like to really um, explore more hybrid experiences of merging like uh, the digital space with the more traditional space to better communicate and educate a larger audience surrounding like what's possible. Um, and then also just unpack like more accessible layers of digital art uh, in public spaces versus um, uh, less accessible, more obscure, uh, challenging um, uh, ways to display this art. So I think that's kind of like the most immediate step I could see through the lens of like the public art space. I think that um, digital art has already been validated um, in, a, in a considerable way. Last year, the Whitney Museum of American Art, which is based here in the Meatpacking District, um, had an expose on digital art with stuff that came out of the 60s and 70s and sort of took you through um, a spectrum of art, not just of digital things, but digital interpretations. There were all these paintings of pixelated forms that come out of digital work translated to paint and other types of art. So um, in terms of its, its platform, it's there. I think that the key is how do you keep pushing it to the wider audience to have it be on, on par with the paintings and the sculptors and the performers um, that we hold in such high regard. And it's gonna come, you know, whether people like it or not, it often needs to be adopted by the, our anchor institutions, be it sold at the highest price at the auction on the chopping block or, you know, on the walls of the Whitney or, you know, the Louvre or the Metropolitan. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's marching its way towards that. Yes, no, I, I agree. Um, and also, uh, perhaps uh, a, there is a, a perception that um, a type of sort of a medium are, is, uh, it's finally accepted when it also enters the, uh, the market fully, like primary market and secondary market. But that's now, it's happening. Christie sold for the first time crypto art. They're now selling Irina Abramovich virtual reality piece. So it's, it's getting market as well, which is obviously positive. So collectors, there will be more collectors out there collecting digital art and familiar with digital art, etc. cetera. Um, so um, to what extent do you think technology can help develop the presence of performance, performance art um, in a digital environment, which require audience to be there. Are there any performance artists who have taken part in Digital Art Month? Uh, um, I think, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, performance art, uh, live performance art now, no, uh, but due to uh, really the sort of the, um, the restrictions uh, of the of the of the pandemic, um, but um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Jess, you want to take this answer in terms of uh, to what extent do you think the technology can help uh, develop the presence of uh, performance art? So I guess yeah. complement performance art. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we're already seeing this a lot. I mean, actually, it, within Digital Art Month, we do have a, a few artists. Uh, 4040, they're a uh, generative art duo, duo and they uh, create audio visual sculptures and perform um, uh, in spaces and in, in really the audio component like we were talking about earlier really adds to what they're creating. Um, so I, I definitely head over, I know we're running out of time, but head over to their Instagram 4040. You can kind of see like what they're doing. And then we have Ben Heim who is a creative technologist and a composer, a classical composer. And he does a lot of performances with his work as well. Like he'll play a musical instrument uh, whilst um, algor algorithmic art is, you know, happening in the background from the music that he's playing. So uh, I think that, uh, yeah, there's, there's tons of performance um, pieces that become more possible because of technology. I mean, touch designer. Yes. Um, is amazing. Like Vincent Fusay, we did like a project with him last year and we had this interactive art wall where people created their own uh, works by walking through the space. It became part of uh, their, um, uh, their movement became part of the artwork essentially. So there, there's a lot that is happening here that is really exciting. And um, I hope that gives you a little bit of an answer to your question. Yes. 
Thank you. But also now we're uh, we're reached uh, well eight p.m. in Italy anyway, <laughs> so two p.m. where you are. So I um, I'm gonna um, let our guests go and thank them again for their time, their expertise, uh, their um, thoughts, um, everything. It's um, it's been it's been great having spoken with you um, and I hope we'll have uh, panels again in the future but also at some point maybe in person. <laughs> I, I long to meet people in person. Agreed and maybe in Italy. Um. Yes, yeah, no, that would be great. Come to Italy, Steph. Let's bring public art to Italy that it's not from the Renaissance so it's more no. contemporary. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.